we have um, our, our next presentation. We also wanted, to, it's also a keynote presentation for the reason that we wanted to highlight some of the issues that are going on in California from a statewide basis. And um, we're, we're very fortunate to have Karen Larson here today uh, to provide that. And she's with the State Water Resources Control Board, uh, the Division of Drinking Water up in Sacramento, where she's the uh, Assistant Deputy Director uh, for the Division of, of Drinking Water. She also uh, manages uh, one of the branches that's involved in a lot of the um, uh, recycled water, so the recycled water unit is under her purview. So at DDW, she helped manages the drinking water regulation development, the oversight of local drinking water regulatory programs, the recycled water permitting, which is a big part of they, their work, and they've really expanded their recycled water unit to address that. Uh, many communities in California are interested in looking at uh, recycled water projects, um, but also emergency response and uh, the laboratory accreditation program for the state. Uh, her uh, division also leads the effort um, on an expert panel looking at regulations for surface water augmentation, so what uh, Jeff Pasek of San Diego was talking about, and the feasibility of criteria for direct potable reuse. Um, I suspect she'll talk a little bit about that, uh, so we'll hear more. So, Karen, thank you for being here, and, and come on up. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I am very honored to be here. Actually, for the very first time, I had to go on the website to figure out what the Clark Prize was. Um, so I'm very pleased to have been invited to speak to this group and uh, listen to all of the presentations today. I'm learning a lot. So thank you, Jeff, for uh, having me. So today I'm going to give a flyover of of water planning and the future of water in California. I have uh, some good news and some bad news and some more bad news and a little bit more bad news and then it gets a little better and then it gets really good at the end, so stick with me. <laughs> so as we all know, California is in the fourth year of severe drought across the state. This year was the driest year in recorded history in the state. Governor Brown proclaimed a state of emergency back in January of 2014 and directed state agencies to do everything in their power and authority to prepare for these drought conditions. He also directed state agency staff to uh, assist farmers and communities that would be impacted by water shortages or even water outages and to ensure that the state can respond to drinking water shortages. So the good news here is that we were able to respond. We uh, got 36 mil allocated $36 million in emergency drought response uh, funding, and we've funded over 100 projects statewide, costing about $25 million so far. And projects are things like replacement wells, emergency interconnections with other water systems, hauled water to fill up water tanks that are being installed at private homes, as well as bottled water, uh, among others. So it's still pretty grim. Reservoirs are at half capacity or less and dropping. We already heard this morning groundwater basins and ecosystems are stressed and wildfire risk is extremely high as we've recently observed from the devastation from the Butte and Valley fires that just occurred a month or so ago. Precipitation in some areas of the state are at the lowest point since records uh, keeping began back in the 1800s. And statewide reservoir storage is down significantly and impacts of four consecutive years of drought are felt everywhere. Sorry, I don't have any good news on that slide. <laughs> Since spring of 2008, groundwater levels have experienced record historical lows in most areas of the state and especially northern portions of the San Francisco Bay region, particularly in the southern San Joaquin Valley, as you can see on these slides, and also the South Lahontan and South Coast regions. In many areas of the San Joaquin Valley, recent groundwater levels are more than 100 feet below previously uh, historic lows. So that's very stunning. 
And hopefully, last year, you did not invest in a ski pass because the snowpack, which is typically about a third of the state's annual uh, runoff, was practically non-existent this year. And at the end of May, the snowpack was about 3% of normal. And if you think El Nino is going to save us, you are wrong. This shows it would take hundreds of percent above normal precipitation for us to just reach the 20th percentile of normal accumulated precipitation. So we need a deluge, many deluges. We need to figure out how to capture that. <laughs> and even worse, as you already heard earlier this morning, we can't expect to return to what we've known as normal. Climate change already is producing a new normal in which the Sierra snowpack will continue to decline and will experience more frequent and extended periods of drought, sea level rise, and other impacts. There is a bright spot, though. Uh, there is some good news. Even with four years of drought, the California economy hasn't suffered as much as one might think. And I credit the robust water supply planning and investments water agencies have made over the last two decades. So kudos to those of you in uh, the utilities here in the room that have uh, been d planning and have the forethought to uh, be ready for such severe conditions. But that kind of forethought and planning needs to continue. So this new normal requires us to think differently about water, and I've already heard uh, earlier today about the one water, but we also need to have the right water for the right use. So starting with one water, we need to think about water as one water, where we manage it as a valuable resource throughout all stages of the water cycle, including the urban water cycle. The state has already taken major steps to holistically managing water by moving the drinking water program from the Department of Public Health under the umbrella of the water boards. One major advantage of housing the clean water programs along with the safe drinking water programs is that we can better integrate source water protection activities. One example is the water boards groundwater ambient monitoring and assessment program that revealed severe nitrate contamination in the Central Valley as well as the Salinas Valley. And what that resulted in were replacement water orders out of our irrigated lands program for places that are receiving high nitrate water. And those kinds of activities will only be more robustly coordinated moving into the future. We also heard earlier that we need to do a better job of managing both surface and groundwater supplies as one water. Surface waters across the state have, uh, are highly regulated in terms of both supply and quality, and yet the groundwater supplies have not received this level of scrutiny. Although now we have, as we heard this morning, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which is a huge leap forward for the state in terms of uh, managing groundwater supplies so that we can prevent further overdraft and subsidence into the future. This map just shows the critically overdrafted uh, basins, and as was mentioned earlier, the Central Valley is really the hotbed of subsidence and overdraft and people running out of water. It is like almost like a third world country in um, Tulare County in particular. One water also means that water that was once viewed as waste or an excess that needed to be removed must now be considered a valuable resource that we need to protect. So stormwater capture is one example, uh, and reuse is a, good, is a growing area of research and water supply planning, and you're gonna hear more about that this afternoon. And as we increase the use of recycled water, particularly for potable reuses, and we decrease the size or even possibly eliminate the environmental buffer between wastewater and drinking water intakes. We, uh, sewer shed protection, source water uh, control, and increased collaboration between wastewater agencies and water agencies um, needs to be, uh, is, is critical moving into the future. And Wastewater agencies and managers of those agencies need to be thinking about optimizing the operations at wastewater treatment plants 
so that they view what they produce as a product rather than just a waste to, dis to dispose of. I'm gonna divert ourselves away from the urban setting for a few minutes and talk about something that's really a big deal for us. Um, and again, Lanier, California is in Tulare County and I'll, I'll reiterate, it's the hotbed of, of activity in terms of small water systems. And one water also applies in these rural and isolated areas, not just in urban settings. As technology improves for accessing new raw water sources like recycled water, we need to keep in mind that small water systems that are getting left behind because they lack the technical, managerial, and financial capacity to even maintain their systems as they are, let alone accessing new supplies and, and using the technology that, that you all are involved with advancing. So where it's feasible, we need to consolidate these systems with larger water systems that are more sophisticated so that these small systems and their customers can take advantage of economies of scale to make water more affordable and the technical expertise to improve water supply reliability for every Californian. We also need better tools to prevent the proliferation of these small water systems. Even though small water systems serve a small fraction of the population in California, the human right to water is law in this state, and we need to work as a water community to achieve its intent. So, diverted a little onto the small water system issue. But here's some good news. Managing water as a single resource also means reducing overall demand through water use efficiency. There was some mention of ag water use efficiency earlier, as well as conservation. And the good news is that Californians have stepped up to the plate and demonstrated that they can achieve astounding conservation goals across the state. And the new normal will require Californians to make that conservation mindset a permanent mindset. It's not a temporary thing. We're not gonna get out of this. There will be more droughts, there, and they will be more extensive. All right, so now I'm gonna turn to the concept of the right water and use the right water for the right purpose and how recycled water fits into that picture. When demands for water must be met, agencies have a number of potential sources that they can turn to. So one is, of course, imported water from the State Water Project, the Central Valley Project, the Colorado River outside of the state. There's also local groundwater supplies. Stormwater, and ca stormwater capture and reuse, as I mentioned earlier, is an ad is a, a advancing area of both research and planning, and not just in the urban setting. This is a report on a pilot project to use excess stormwater to recharge groundwater aquifers in agricultural areas. So more to come on that. This has already been mentioned as well, desalination of brackish and ocean water, like what uh, is uh, coming into place here in the next month or so in Carlsbad. As well as gray water reuse, like what's being uh, done in the San Francisco uh, Public Utilities Commission building. They uh, have their living machine that recycles water within the, the building uh, for non-potable uses, like flushing toilets, for example. If you ever get a chance to go uh, tour that facility, it is really quite remarkable. Then there's also non-potable reuse of tertiary treated water for uses like agriculture, industrial uses, landscape irrigation, and others. And we've seen this picture a number of times already today. There's groundwater replenishment with advanced treated recycled water as what's going on here in Orange County. And Augmenting surface water supplies with advanced treated uh, recycled water. The San Vicente Reservoir Project that you heard about is one that is conditionally approved and we're working with the city of San Diego to um, advance that project, as well as working on some regulations, just a little regulations that we need to do to get those in place by the end of next year. And then possibly one day direct potable reuse of advanced treated um, recycled water. And there are a range of water users from agriculture to industry to residences, commercial properties, and institutions. 
And each of these users have a range of needs and they need to evaluate for cost and suitability the right water for the use and for the demand. So with that in mind, we need to keep recycled water in context. Many in the recycled water community are putting pressure on the state to make decisions faster. But we need to be sure to balance the desire to move quickly with protecting public health and ensuring that public health is protected. In a recent meeting with a number of mayors in Southern California, the governor, ex Governor Brown, expressed his support for recycled water projects and was actually quite animated and interested in the topic. And in fact, uh, some of my staff and Cindy Forbes, my boss, are going to be uh, briefing the governor this afternoon at four o'clock uh, on that very, not the governor, his staff, on that very subject. So there's quite a bit of interest all the way up to the top in the administration. But he also cautioned that we need to do it right. We cannot afford to fail because one failure will ruin it for everyone. And so while California's water supply picture is grim and we mustn't drag our feet, we also must ensure that the research and technology and the systems are robust enough that we and the public health er, and, and the public at large are confident that public health is protected. So I told you there'd be some great news at the end, and really the reality is, is you all are the great news. We're here gathered to honor the great work that all of you, and particularly the past and present Clark Prize winners, on your. Uh, um, talented and uh, passionate research and a development of the technology to advance uh, across the nation, but also in California, uh, water supply and uh, new technology. So congratulations to you. You are the great news that I'll end with. So thank you very much. Karen, thank you very much. That was great. So we do have, we have time for questions for Karen. So this is your opportunity to ask about things related to the state, the State Water Board uh, regulations or thing that they're working on or may be working on. It's not as interesting as you guys all do it, that's for sure. So I have a question, I have okay. a question Karen. So Karen and I uh, see a lot of each other because uh, and Deborah uh, manages one of the expert panels, and, and Karen's very good about showing up at those panels and hearing firsthand what's going on, so that's, that's great. Uh, but in terms of staffing, I've seen some changes, mm -hmm. and the Recycled Water Unit has staffed up quite a bit, and um, just in terms of everything you have to do, is that a constraint in terms of resources, where you are from a staffing point of view or a resources point of view? You say the governor supports a lot of this work, and you guys are asked to make decisions, but do you have all the tools you need to be able to respond to all these demands? Well, I think we have the tools to respond to the legislative mandates, that's for sure. I mean, that's the highest priority, right? But in terms of the permitting of projects, I think we're largely on track for all of the portable reuse projects. Uh, what we do have is backlogs in getting non-potable. I mean, it's just ramping up, 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 up with the drought and much more demand on um, getting permits out. So both at the regional board as well as our district offices are very taxed with, with reviewing right. those projects. But we're trying to streamline some things with a, a general order for water recycling requirements that will streamline the permitting process. We're hoping to get that in place at the beginning of the year. So that'll help all of us, although the, the review of projects is probably the biggest backlog. Right. I think generally speaking, uh, uh, your, the staff in DDW has been very responsive to all these projects that are being uh, proposed, and that, that's been great to see. Um, other questions for Karen? Pierre? Hey, yes, Karen. I mean, the, in the last two or three decades, we've had two big panels uh, looking at the obstacles to you know, encouraging more recycled water, you know, whether it be purple pipe or whatever. And a lot of those recommendations have yet been implemented. Uh, they include in incidental runoff, I mean, which has changed from, you know, you know, a small amount to a little, still a very small amount uh, on tertiary water. Uh, the, you know, all the signs and everything, all the annual inspections that have to be done, which are very costly. Isn't there some 
point in time where after you've done these for a number of years, you know, you don't have to do an annual inspection to make sure they're not cross-connected. I mean, these are you know, inspections that were done in the infancy of the recycled water systems, uh, and th they have really matured and you know become accepted and reliable. Uh, but we still have we still push on a lot of expense in getting into recycled water. Orange County Water District goes through it in their Green Acres project. And Irvine, which I represent, uh, goes through it in their system that's been delivering recycled water since the 60s. Uh, isn't there a point where you become just like a water district again instead of s something handling a pollutant? I'm not quite sure how to respond to that because, uh, to be honest, I haven't been in the weeds of implementing like at the district office level. So my boss would be a better woman to answer that question. But in the, uh, the one thing that comes to mind is that uh, there have been incidences of cross connections that, uh, you know, one that I can think of that Cindy has in told me about is a sorority that said, you know, the water smells like crap. And it was a cross connection. And so we want to certainly avoid uh, that and it's the public health that needs to be protected in the end so yeah. and, and that is usually going to come up as more and more like um, San Francisco has passed an ordinance that if you're a building of a certain size you have to um, use the gray water within your building so we're going to see a lot of these what I call on-site treatment systems and so they'll be less than municipal level here and uh, it's, it's definitely a concern on site deals. What I'm talking about is you have skull and crossbones on signs saying don't drink the, the recycled water where all the irrigation water in the city or that area might be recycled water and every landscaper knows that. Uh, you know, you, know, for, you just create this you know, public resistance going, gee, this is really unsafe, it's terrible, people are going to die when it's actually better quality water than you get in ma the majority of the world right now, you know, for the majority of the population of the world. Uh, you know, the prohibitions against putting more than a thousand gallons, you know, a spill of a thousand gallons of tertiary water into a, a water body, uh, when it's actually cleaner than the, the ambient water that's in the water body to start off with, uh, you know, if I was an example, if I'm in Sacramento <clears throat> and I ran a recycled water system, it's built right down by Laguna Slough, uh, right next to the city of uh, the Sac Regional Plant that puts out 157 million gallons a day, I could be in violation and fined. But the quality of the water going in there would be far superior to that put out by Sac Regional coming through the slough. Okay, right, so I'm, Pierre, I know that Water Reuse California is working a lot on those issues on the state level. So we have a question over here, correct? Hi, so um, my question is, um, what do you see the future in uh, gray water for utilities or utilities for gray water systems in homes? Is there like a big push for that or you just don't want to uh, wait till it gets to treatment and treat it there to uh, I guess make sure it's you know, at the levels it should be or? So um, there is a lot of interest in gray water, uh, at spe especially recently in the legislature. Lots of legis legislators want to do something about the drought and want to advance the use of gray water. Um, as San Francisco PUC is doing an expert panel review right now to make some recommendations on gray water um, reuse. I'll just say, as in terms of residential, uh, there has been even some talk of allowing residential reuse of black water, which scares the bejesus out of us, right? Um, and the other issue, of course, is that um, regulating it at that level is uh, not a simple thing. So how do we, how do, we do it right? And um, how do we advance the technology to do it right? So. Um, okay, any other questions for Karen? Sean? You just pass that back. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Sean DeBrew. I'm with Kennedy Jenks Consultants. First of all, uh, it was a great presentation, and, and um, thank you and, and the department for really rising to the challenge of, of all the, the drought related projects that are going on, and in, in particular, potable reuse. And my question is um, the way the current potable reuse regulations stand, there is a heavy reliance on diluent water or surface water, storm water, water other than recycled water to be added before that water is groundwater recharge. And considering looking at the reservoirs and the levels of those reservoirs, if, it, as the, if the drought continues, that is going to be, um, that's gonna be a real challenge to make these projects go forward. So do you, um, do you foresee um, that large dependence on diluent water or, or the relaxing of that uh, as the drought continues? Well, I think I'm going to interpret your question a little bit. Um, uh, yes, I think that we're, we need to move toward what's, what Adam Oliveri, our, our a expert panel chair, would say is there's a continuum of recycled water from uh, in, essentially indirect potable reuse with an environmental bu buffer and then how how much can we shrink that environmental buffer and really it is a continuum we have this sort of um, artificial difference between indirect potable reuse and direct potable reuse but really it's a continuum and so where do we draw that line and so what I think you're saying is how can we have something closer to direct potable reuse can we shrink the environmental buffer whether it be through dilution or um, or the actual amount of time that water spends in that environmental buffer can that be shrunk and what are the going to be the requirements to doing that and I and that's really about the the feasibility of direct potable reuse and we're actively working on that and I encourage you to keep paying attention to what we're doing with respect to the feasibility of DPR and our surface water augmentation regulations okay so Karen thank you very much and we appreciate yeah. you taking the time to come down here to speak with us thank you. <clears throat>